Okay, uh, syllabus. My name is uh, Chad Stevens. My background is in medicinal chemistry, which is uh, drug design, drug development, organic chemistry related to that. Um, for the first time, uh, we're doing a little bit different this summer. I'm teaching the lectures, both lectures combined. Dr. Adele is teaching both lab sections. When you go to lab today or tomorrow or whenever, we'll have Dr. Adele in lab, and I imagine she'll give you some information when you get there. Okay. Um, the, uh, the syllabus is there. I expect that you can read and you will read. I'm not going to read anything to you. Okay. Syllabus, anything written in the handouts I give you, uh, any information in the lab manual or workbook is meant to be read. Okay. Things that I write down, I don't want to repeat because it's a waste of time. I imagine you can read, you will read, okay? Uh, directions are to be read and then followed weekly. Not read once and put away. Okay? Written materials are very important. Uh, basically, I did say that uh, things will be recorded. There's a link to the, uh, the YouTube page. Uh, everything is there. Great. Uh, textbook, there's a official textbook for the course, uh, Klein, this is the regular hardback version. In the bookstore, it's a paperback custom version with a different ISBN number, missing a chapter or two paperback, so it's a little bit cheaper. But still, you can get this on Amazon for cheaper than the paperback here in the bookstore. Uh, I recommend, I highly recommend the solutions manual to go with it. Uh, I don't know what you guys like these days, but I would prefer to have a solutions manual right there with me. Okay. Uh, you can use any other textbook you want. I don't refer to the textbook much. I don't have problems in the textbook. If you have an old textbook from your cousin or somewhere or your favorite textbook, please use it. I would recommend the solutions manual to go along with it. Okay. Any topics we cover will be in any organic textbook. All you got to do is look at the index. You find lots of uh, information about the topics, lots of problems. Okay. The goal is not to use a specific textbook. The goal is for you to learn organic chemistry. Uh, you do need a lab techniques book that covers the lab techniques. Uh, the one of record uh, in the bookstore is the one by Morig and co-authors, uh, Laboratory Techniques in Organic Chemistry. Um, you can use others. We used to use one by Zubert. Uh, it's now in the 9th or 10th edition. Uh, you can use one of these. Uh, this you can get on Amazon. I've seen them for a penny on Amazon, $3.99 shipping, four bucks. Okay. Any addition would work. Any addition is going to have the magic man on there. Basically, these types of books just cover the laboratory techniques. Um, the goal is not for you to have a book. The goal is for you to come to lab prepared. If you can come to lab prepared without a book or some other resource, it's fine with me. You can ask Dr. Rodney. Okay? Um, you also need a lab notebook. Uh, this type is sold in the bookstore, Spiral Bound. Uh, Spiral Bound is okay as long, as long as the page numbers are, or the no pages are numbered. Um, also makes carbon copies. Dr. Rydell may give you other, or this is pretty much what she's going to tell you. Um, okay, syllabus. Let's see what else is there. Okay, there will be an SI session, or basically three per week, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, uh, 12 to 1, Science Hall, 73,007. That means today at noon, SI session, supplemental instruction, be led by Courtney Fairchild. She just took organic one and two to meet this past academic year. She should do a good job at answering questions. Um, that's basically a group. Uh, group tutorial session, okay? Um, go there, ask any questions you want. Uh, please make the most of it. Um, after arrive on time, class starts at 9 o'clock. Um, I'll try to get here 5 or 10 minutes early. Uh, good time to ask questions before we get started. Um, okay. Everything here. Uh, some comments about studying, uh, 
basically you've got to keep up in organic chemistry, a big difference between gen chem and organic. Gen chem, you, you have a, a test on these couple of topics. When the test is over, you move on to totally different topics most of the time. Okay? Organic chemistry is not like that. Stuff we cover for test one, we'll then turn around and use for test two. If you didn't learn the stuff for test one, test two is going to be way more difficult. You're going to be relearning or trying to learn stuff in test one. Get to test three, test stuff from test one and two, okay, it builds. Organic chemistry builds. Take an organic two, what you learn in organic one is the foundation for moving on to organic two, okay? Get behind, you try to memorize and not learn, like the syllabus talks about, this is going to become overload. Okay. Those that do well, start day one, put in the time, and learn fundamentally what's going on. Okay. Uh, main thing is uh, asking questions. Okay. That doesn't mean just asking me questions, but asking yourself questions. Sit down, looking at the material, what do I need to know here? What do I need to know about formal charges? Do I know how to determine a formal charge? Where would I see a formal charge in, in organic chemistry? Why do I need to know formal charges? Okay? When you sit down, ask questions of yourself, and also ask me questions anytime. Okay? I talk about in the uh, syllabus, getting a composition notebook, and writing down your questions. Okay? Well, over the course of a week or two, and by the way, this is an accelerated pace in the summer, uh, so we can get that down to a couple of days. You may have a number of questions, and then when it's time to maybe ask some, you can't remember but one. But if you write them down, bring them by office hours, and just we'll check them off. Boom, boom, boom. Talk about them. There you go. <coughs> Organization. You've got to organize your material. Okay? There's lots of material. Anybody need a composition notebook? No, I, no, I don't. Um, you don't need one. Anybody need a composition notebook? Question. Um, are we are we going to see any chapters that would be normally covered in like the fall or spring semester course? Are we covering the? Are we? Are we? Are it's we the same course as fall or spring, okay. just condensed time. I also talk about uh, note cards, a good way to write down material, uh, maybe on the back, you know, front you write some questions uh, for yourself and then you use them as a study guide, uh, you say, oh, I know that, I know that, you know, oh, I forgot that, okay, good way to review, anybody need some note cards? I didn't see who raised your hand first, we'll get you some others. Oh, Yes. Um, okay, if I got a uh, lab technique book, notebook, everything. Okay. Um, okay, back to the second page is our daily outline. Uh, I'll tell you what we're doing today, we're already behind. Okay. Uh, Structures of some common drugs. Basically, organic chemistry is found everywhere. Um, my background is again in drug development. I use uh, drug structures to illustrate things. Uh, here's some common drugs. A number of you have taken many of these, like uh, Tylenol, um, etc. You can refer to these when we cover functional groups. For example, right here we have a carboxylic acid and an ether uh, in naproxen. Uh, you will be doing a lab with naproxen, a polarimetry lab this semester. Uh, others. Also we have this sheet here that illustrates some of the types of questions. Ibuprofen. Some of the types of questions we'll address and by the end of the course hopefully you'll be able to readily answer. What's the chemical formula of ibuprofen? What's one of the main functional groups? What do the dashed and bold bonds mean? What type of bonds make up the structure? What's the hybridization of the oxygen atom? What functional groups are present? Is ibuprofen acidic or basic? What does racemic mean? What's an enantiomer? Why is one S and one R plus or minus? How does the drug company synthesize ibuprofen? We'll do a little bit of synthesis, more in organic too. 
Okay, there's some other questions along the way. Then there's some advanced questions. These are the types of questions that we're setting the foundation for. Then we, we move on to biochemistry or pharmacology, maybe in medical school, dental school, pharmacy. Uh, you'll be prepared to then uh, study and answer. Okay. Anybody want to get a job one day? We got we got one here. We got another one here. Okay. Nobody else? Uh huh. Okay. Here's a job ad. Uh, this is this is 10, 15 years old, but these come out every month in uh, CNE News mag magazine. Okay. Uh, basically, right here is the syllabus for the course. Okay. This course is preparing you to get a job. This in organic two. Boom. They're looking for a BS or MS in organic chemistry and experience with multi-step organic synthesis reactions. We'll do that for an organic two. Purification of organic compounds. You will hopefully be doing that in lab. Uh, must have an under understanding of fundamental reaction mechanisms. We'll do plenty of that. Reaction mechanisms. Functional group reactivity. We'll learn functional groups and then we'll study the reactivity of them. That's what organic chemistry is all about. As well as familiarity with spectroscopy techniques such as NMR, IR, mass spec. NMR is carbon organic 2, IR on test 1 here, mass spec test 3 here. Spectral interpretation. We'll learn how to interpret spectra. Okay. Basically, that's the syllabus for the course, and it's a job ad. Get you a job. Drug companies treat their employees very well. Uh, great salaries, great benefits. Gourmet buffets for lunch, weight rooms on site, daycare on site. Okay. Uh, this department does now have a medicinal chemistry emphasis. We have medicinal chemistry courses. So we're in the chemistry. We prepare you to go in and take courses in medicinal chemistry here. Um, Okay, anybody want to fail this class? Daniel? No? Well, if you want to, here you go. Here's how you do it. All right? I made it easy for you. I spell it out. Uh, Pre-course questionnaire. I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Uh, if you please fill this out, turn it in tomorrow here in class. Okay? Sort of thing, why are you taking this course? Everybody know why you're taking this course? It's got to be more than just a pre -read. Okay. This course can change your life. It can empower you to go and succeed in uh, anything you can do in science. Okay. Um, so, The, uh, the meet and greet, we met and we went over these questions on the purple on Friday. Uh, in addition to that, there's some other uh, stuff here. There's some questions about clindamycin. Anybody know clindamycin? Cleason? Yeah? Questions about clindamycin here, the structure. Uh, there's some other medicinal chemistry applications, new drug for tuberculosis. Uh, on the back, a new drug for melanoma. Basically, structure, okay? Got to get familiar with structures. Organic chemistry is all about structures and reactivity. I try to give you some of these uh, little things to make it very relevant, okay? Uh, you're not going to see a question about uh, Zilberath on the test, okay? This is just extra information uh, that hopefully makes it more interesting and see the application of what we're doing. Uh, syllabus there. Okay, green sheet is our outline. I'll typically put those on colored pages. Green means go. Cover up iron. Sheet for go. We're ready? We're going to start with, guess what? Review of atomic structure. Okay. And we're going to have uh, handouts. Yeah, it's going to be the one that says functional groups. I'll be right on the board. I'll refer to a handout and the outline. Okay. So the first one is functional groups and DUS, degrees of attachment, warm up. Uh, many of my handouts I give what's called a warm up. 
I uh, got this from Dr. Hogger, but I, I do it differently. Basically, it's some questions to sort of get you thinking. Read, okay, you're probably going to read and not have any idea how to do it. But this is what we hope to be able to do uh, when test time comes. Some of the questions may also be sort of a, a interesting, challenging, relevant to drugs. Um, some of them more, more so than others. This is pretty straightforward at the outset. Um, for example, how many degrees of unsaturation does each drug above contain? All right. Now we typically are not going to sit right here and do those right here. This is for you to basically do as homework. Okay. And so uh, we may not ever refer to these unless you ask a question about them. Okay. But such questions are types you'll see on a test. Uh, and so you get a little flavor of the types of questions I ask. Uh, when we come to lecture, I would hope that you have looked ahead in handouts and, and worked on problems. So when you come to lecture, you'll be ready to ask questions. You say, hey, I had trouble with doing the DUS of this drug here. Tell me why I got it wrong. Or tell me if I got it right. Okay. Um, so, where are we starting at? Uh, review of atomic structure. Questions about anything? Uh, the workbook. As the, uh, I sent out an email. I'll send emails uh, almost routinely. I'll send it to your GRU email address. Uh, I do have a workbook, lab manual for this course. Uh, I used to give out many more handouts, but I put a lot of them in, a, in this workbook here uh, with answer keys in the back. Some of them are short answers, some of them are multiple choice. Uh, there's also the lab manual portion here in the back half with all the labs, the lab uh, guidelines, uh, directions for using instruments in labs. Directions for writing lab reports, etc. Fifteen dollars in the main chemistry and physics department office. Uh, Fifteen dollars cash. Only. Okay. I think you'll find it a uh, pretty good deal. Uh, again, organization and material. And hopefully, this is nice to organize for you. Uh, let's get started. Atomic structure. Assuming you have a good background of gen chem. Uh, Organic chemistry. Studied carbon based compounds, yeah? That's rather simplistic. Organic compounds are everywhere and they have unique and, uh, properties that can be used for all types of things materials, mentioned drugs, polymers. Uh, you know, organic compounds in your, in your flat screen TVs giving you the picture. A lot of research went into developing those molecules that could uh, give you the color um, in your flat screen TV. Okay, atomic structure. Well, let's start with carbon. Um, let's see. What's the atomic number of carbon? Six here. Uh, we can put twelve here. Typically listed like this. Uh, how many protons in carbon? Protons. Six. Uh, how many neutrons? Six. Let's put let's put neutrons uh, here. How many neutrons? Six. Uh, it depends. It can vary, right? Okay. If we're saying this isotope, this is carbon-12. By the way, you typically don't need to list that because every carbon is six, no matter what. Okay. So what's that number called? Atomic mass. Okay. Mass number twelve. Uh, six neutrons. Okay. So this is twelve, and that's that. How many electrons? Assuming this is neutral. 
Six. Six, six, six. There you go. Carbon 12. Uh, you could also have carbon 13. What's the relationship between these two? Isotopes, right? What's the difference here? Six protons. How many neutrons? Seven. Six electrons, assuming it is neutral. Uh, then you could also have carbon 14. Carbon 14 would have eight neutrons, yeah. Uh, what's the percent of these natural abundance? What's the percent of carbon 12 in your body? Yeah, this is like 99% uh, or 99.9%. Well, we'll say 99 because it's closer to 99. Okay, this is about 1%. Uh, how much carbon-14 is in your body? Very minor amount, okay? Negligible, it's in the noise. But it's enough that you can do radio dating, okay? Cavemen from 2 million years ago, you can do carbon-14 radio dating because it's carbon-14 is radioactive. Uh, very minor. What about carbon-11? Carbon-11 is man-made isotope, not natural, okay? Carbon-11 is used for some type of uh, uh, imaging, uh, like PET imaging, okay? Uh, Carbon-11 is also radioactive, but it's man-made. Some elements can be made artificially, yeah? Okay, uh, so you got to be able to do this with all of them. Uh, tellurium-128, how many protons? How many protons? I got a periodic table. How many? Fifty-two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, you need a periodic table. And you need to be able to deal with those. So these are isotopes. Yeah. Uh, electron configuration for carbon twelve. Let's see here. We have 1s, 2s, and then what's next? 2p. How many p orbitals? Three. And so we have six electrons. One, two, three, four. Fill these up according to Hun's rule, all principle, all the exclusion principle, and like that. So those are your six electrons. By the way, where are these two found? Nucleus. Electrons are outside the nucleus. Okay, so all basic. Uh, what do you call these two in this shell? Valence shell. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. Four valence electrons. Okay. These two down here we, we often forget about when we're doing chemistry. So that's, that's the subshell. Four valence electrons. Did we do anything new? No. This is ground state configuration. We will do hybridization. When we do hybridization, we'll start here, but we will mix these orbitals and create new orbitals. Um, what types of orbitals, what do these orbitals look like? What's an S orbital look like? In a spherical there, nucleus at the center. What's the difference between 1S and 2S? Barbara? 2s, what's the difference? Size, yeah, okay. Larger. Uh, what's p orbital look like? Something like this. Um, when we get to hybrid orbitals, we will mix those together and we'll get new orbitals that will be called hybrids and they'll look a little bit different. Um, did we cover everything under room number one?
to bonding. Uh, covalent bond. If we have a hydrogen, how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. Okay. Uh, this periodic table is quite small. How many electrons? We do covalent bond. What, what's the atom looking to achieve? Complete valence shell. What, what shell are we dealing with? Ah. 1s. How many electrons go in 1s? 2. 2 electrons in, uh, in the... We need one more electron, right? Okay. How can it get an electron? Uh, well, you could uh, just somehow get an electron and you could have two electrons there. But this would be charged, right? H minus is possible. Another way is if we team this up with another lonely guy. See, these two guys are lonely. They want, they want friends. Okay? Single electron is a radical. It's not, it's not stable. Electrons prefer to be paired. Also, if we pair them up, what can we get? Now, this electron is going to come over here and leave this as H+. Plus. This is set up to do covalent bonding, sharing. So what we can get is the two electrons can sit between the two H's. One electron coming from H, one electron coming from H. And this can sit here, and this can be a covalent bond. Okay? Very simplistic. You can get a book about that thick, all about that right there. Okay? There's a lot to it. Um, how do we usually show this? That's a two electron covalent bond. I usually show that with just what? Just a dash, okay? Two electron covalent bond. And now when we count the so-called octet rule, it's not octet here, because H doesn't want eight <coughs> electrons around. How many is H1? Two. Two, so it can become like helium. When you do octet count, or duet count, you get to count these electrons for both. So you say that H has two electrons around it, you can also say that H has two electrons around. Almost as if there's four electrons here, but there's not. This is the way you count them. Question? What would the shape of that S orbital then be whenever they're shared like that? Is it roughly spherical or is it more bulged in the middle? I said book about that thick up. <laughs> um, yeah, it depends on. Uh, yeah, I'm not prepared to give you a quick answer. So. Good question. Uh, that type of question, though, uh, points out that the bonding, there's a lot deeper to it. Okay, you can take advanced classes on just bonding. But typically, pretty simplistic, the idea of just two electron covalent bonds is very simplistic. When we do hybridization, we'll see a little bit more uh, and talk about just orbital overlap. Uh, foundation of, your, of the answer there is all of mathematics. Uh, Okay, one take home is hydrogen makes how many bonds? One, it just makes one bond, okay? That's all it needs to get to, to get a duet, to be like helium. When you make a bond, you get an extra electron. So let's go to carbon. How many advanced electrons does carbon have? Four. And those are the four that we're going to deal with. Those are the four that, that are involved with bonding. Uh, so if we take carbon, I put one on, one on the hydrogen, well let's put four here. I'm going to put them around like that. Now back over here, I could have showed this with maybe a, maybe a star, and that had been that electron. And then over here, I could have sort of starred that and say the star came from that guy, the dot came from that guy, two electrons, sort of better keep track of where it came from. So this other H brought in the star, and now there's two electrons around that H. Here's the starting electrons. Uh, how many electrons do we want around carbon? Eight. Eight. So now we're in octet, because we're on the second row. 
this bond is to hydrogen. We can bring in a, um, an H with an electron. The H has one electron. And we can make a bond here. And we can do that, we can do that four times. So the four dots are the starting carbon valence electrons. And then we brought in four H's. Each one of them can have just one, one electron. We teamed it up. And so this equals, if we turn these into just covalent bond dashes, we have something like this. Two electrons, two electrons. So how many are around carbon now? Two, four, six, eight. You get to count all the electrons as an octet. But also, how many around the H? So you get to count those as this, so two around the H. So everybody's happy. A for carbon, two for each A. And what do we have here? This is just CH4, and we call this methane. Uh, could we get a good structure for, and I'm going to kind of go across here, we'll do nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Could we get a good structure with five H's? I mean, why do we not have five H's around carbon? Well, now you got ten electrons around carbon. How many bands of electrons can carbon have? Why only eight? How many bands of orbitals does carbon have? I just erased them. They were here. Four. One S, the, the, the two S, and the three two P's. Four. How many electrons in each orbital? Two. Four times two is. Eight. That's all you can put up there is eight. If you got ten, where are they going to go? Four orbitals get eight electrons max. Okay. You can't be putting ten around there. That's no go. Um, what about just three? Well, now the carbon doesn't have an octet. And in terms of if we go back to a star and a dot, it looks like there's only three dots from carbon. Where's the other dot or electron? Because carbon has four valence electrons. You want to just leave it sitting there as a, as a radical? I mean, that would be a methyl radical, but it's just not good. Um, okay? So there's a variety of things we can discuss there, why it turned out to be four ages. Um, let's look at nitrogen. Nitrogen is, is next as we go across. And what we're going to do here is, uh, this is typical bonding. What's typical bonding for carbon? Four bonds, zero lone pairs. Nitrogen, how many valence electrons? Five. One, two, three, four. And then I'm going to pair up for the fifth one. Why do I go around four and then pair up? Because the four is the four valence orbitals that we're dealing with, really. Now, how many bonds? Question? I think it would be two, they're going to be in their one header, the two S one, the one. Really, it's going to be hybridized. We haven't got the hybridization yet. So, how many bonds do we need to make? We need to team that up with an H or anything else. It could be, you know, uh, team this up with an H and team this up with an H. And now, is that nitrogen happy for the noctet? I mean, around there. Two, four, six, eight. So what do we have here? We have NH3. What's that called? Ammonia. What's typical bonding for nitrogen? It's shown right here. Three bonds. One lone pair. So he's got a lone pair. A lone pair of electrons. Call it a LP. Not a record. Okay, 
oxygen. How many advanced electrons? Six, two, three, four. Now we have to pair up and we get like that. How many bonds do we need to make? Bring in an H, bring in an H, and what do we have? H2O. It's called Agua. Uh, what's typical bonding for oxygen? Show them right here. Two bonds, two long pairs. Uh, what's next across the periodic table of chlorine? How many bounce electrons? Four, five, six, seven. How many bonds do we need to make? We just need to team up right here. We can bring in an H with its one electron, team up. And what do we get? We get this HF. If I show it out full, it would be shown, okay, like this. I didn't show water or ammonia out, but basically dash, 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 well there. Right? Uh, what's that called? I'm not going to write it out. Hydrogen fluoride, putting water, it's hydrogen fluoride acid. Okay? Uh, what's typical bonding for fluorine? One bond. One bond, three long pairs. Okay? So we went across row two. What's typical bonding for bromine? Same as fluorine. What's typical bonding for arsenic? Same as nitrogen. Okay? This is typical bonding. With typical, this is the typical bonding, and the atom will be neutral. Okay? If, you, if it's not typical bonding, the atom will typically be charged. Okay? So if I show you NH2, and that's probably going to be, well, H can't be in the middle because it only makes one bond. H has to be on the periphery, right? It only makes one bond. So you have to be something like this. Then you have to determine lone pairs, et cetera, et cetera. But you ain't going to have three bonds and one lone pair. And nitrogen is going to be charged, most likely. If it ain't typical, it's probably going to have a charge. We'll do charge pretty soon, maybe even now. Questions about typical charge. Is typical charge of day? Is the typical charge midway through organic two? Um, typical bonding. Covalent bond. Uh, basically, Lewis structures. This would be a complete Lewis structure. What's a Lewis structure? You show all covalent bonds with a dash, and you show all lone pairs. All valence electrons shown. All valence electrons shown, including lone pairs. Now, when you see a structure in a text, usually the lone pairs are not shown. For example, on the drug, on the workbook cover, the long pairs on this oxygen are not shown. Okay? How many are there? Two. Two. Because what's standard bonding for oxygen? Two bonds, two, two, bonds, two long pairs. Nothing is charged. If it was charged, I would show you the charge. Okay? The two bonds happen to be a double bond, so that's two bonds, okay? Chlorine up there, how many lone pairs on the chlorine? Three, because it's typical bonding is what? A bond, three lone pairs, okay? See where the... But if you're asked to draw a Lewis structure in like a quiz or test format, you need to show the lone pairs, because that's what a true Lewis structure is. Uh, OK, 
Okay, let's start getting into bonding. By the way, Gilbert Lewis is one who wrote uh, one of these thick books on bonding. Nature of the chemical bond. That's it. Check it out. Good reading on Saturday morning. Uh, he also won Nobel Prize. Uh, one of the few that won two Nobel Prizes, I believe. One in chemistry and also I think he won one for peace. To be structures with single bonds. Let's see here. Uh, while I'm erasing, good time to ask questions. Start putting together some structures. I got C H four O. <laughs> Show a Lewis structure for that. What's a Lewis structure? All bonds and all lone pairs. So you have to think about the connectivity. What atoms are connected to what? That's one thing you have to think about. You show all valence electrons, right? Yeah? I underlined it over there. All valence electrons. Wouldn't it be good to know how many valence electrons we're dealing with? If you got to show them all? I think so. How many valence electrons are we dealing with? How many does carbon have? So valence electrons. Carbon has four. How many does each H have? One times four equals four. How many is O? Six. How many total we got? Fourteen. Did I add them up right? I had math in a long time. Fourteen? So when we get down, we should have fourteen valence electrons in our structure, yeah? I recommend doing that first. Makes sense, yeah? Okay. What do we know about H? How many bonds does it make? Can the H be in the middle? No. No. It's on the periphery. I'd start by bonding your heavy atoms. What's a heavy atom? It's a non-H. Ah, uh, well, we only have two, so let's start by bonding them together. This formula. Formulas are CH and then alphabetical. I mean, if I draw CH4, there'd be no place to put the O. Heavy atoms bonded first. Next, I would bond the H's. And I would recommend this. I put the H's on carbon. How many can we put on this carbon? One, two, three. Note I'm not considering bond angles right now. I haven't got that far yet. Okay, how many more H's we got? One. Where do you want to put it? Oxygen. Oxygen. Ah, Bennett. Okay, what else? How many advanced electrons we got up here? Two, four, six, eight, ten. We gotta put four more. Where do you want to put them? There's twelve. Here's fourteen. Standard bonding for carbon, four bonds, no lone pairs. Standard bonding for oxygen, two bonds, two lone pairs. There you go. Here's a good structure. That happens to be methanol. Meth is a one carbon, methane, OL means it's an alcohol, it's a one carbon alcohol. Don't drink it, make it go blind. Moonshiners go blind because the alcohol they make has a lot of wood alcohol in it. This, this type of thing, they go blind. Uh, okay. Want to try another? About C2. H6O. Put together a structure for that one while I'm erasing here. We'll leave this up here.
me a note a little bit about formulas. This is just pure formula here. Okay? Pure formula. C, H, and then alphabet. Sometimes you'll see things written sort of like this, where they're giving you a little information in the formula. Okay? They put that fourth H over there on the oxygen. Okay? But that still adds up to this. So a lot of times when you write the formula for methanol, you'll actually write it like that. A little bit of information. Anybody got something over here? Let's see. Carbon, carbon, oxygen. Six H's. I'll put one here, one here, one here. Basically, you want to complete the valence of carbon with your H's. Three right around there, here, and where's the other one? How many valence electrons are we dealing with? Uh, what's that? Eight. Six is fourteen. Six, what? Twenty. How many have we got here? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. We need four more. Where do we want to do? Now we have twenty valence electrons. Standard bonding for oxygen. Question. Um, so, how much energy we lost to draw these? Would we be able to draw it linear, or would we be able to take off because the whole age? We have to draw it bent. Uh, we haven't talked about hybridization of geometry yet. Um, you know, moving forward, we'll probably draw this kind of just condensed. Okay. So, can, are we, if we were to draw the full Lewis structure, oh, full Lewis structure? Now, do we have to do it then, or will linear be okay? Full Lewis structure, you'd want to have the H. Uh, I'd probably accept this. Okay. But at some point, you're going to be asked about the geometry. Okay. Um, anybody get something different here? Good, what'd you get? Put the O in the middle. Uh, C, O, C. Complete the valences of carbon with H's. How many H's we got? Six. Oh, that's going to work out nice. There's six. What do you want to put on the oxygen? Two long pairs. That's also a 20 valence electrons. Huh, what do we have here? What's the relationship between these two? They have the same formula. Where are they? Isomers. Yes, but there's different types of isomers. What type of isomers are these? Constitutional isomers. What's the definition of constitutional isomers? Same formula. Different. The, the word is connectivity. You can say that a variety of ways. Things are connected differently. The O is connected to two carbons over here, over there it's only connected to one. Same formula, different connectivity. Later on we'll see other types of isomers. Isomers have the same connectivity, it's just that maybe they differ in their orientation in space. For example, this here, okay, you be you be a molecule with arms out, okay. I'm an arm molecule like this. We both have arms connected to the shoulders, but his are straight the same way, mine are opposite. Okay, so those have the same connectivity, but they differ in the orientation of space. Those are called stereoisomers. These are constitutional isomers, first type of isomer. Uh, I don't think there's another type of, steer, of constitutional ice here. That's two for that formula. Uh, okay, let's try CH2O. Questions? Let's change this to a two. How many valence electrons are we dealing with? Four, six, twelve. Okay, twelve valence electrons. Uh, everybody agree we're going to do CO? Find your heavy atoms. Two H's, where do you want to put them? I recommended filling the valence of carbon first. Uh oh, we only have two. We need another bond here. How many, how many electrons do we have up here? Two, four, six. We got six more. Double bond. Yes, but let's do it systematically so we learn how to do it. When it gets more complicated, you need a system. 
Okay. From here we have long pairs. How many long pairs can we put up there? Three. Three long pairs, three bonds, for a total of twelve. Let's put them up as long pairs first. I recommend putting H's on carbon. Long pairs, I recommend putting them on your heteroatoms. Heteroatom means non-carbon. Oxygen, nitrogen, halogen. Why? Because which one is more electron greedy? Carbon or oxygen? Oxygen likes electrons more. Give it what it wants. Okay? Now, I said put H's on carbon, but actually you want to fill the valence of oxygen first. But that's after you H's. Now let's make this oxygen happy. How many long pairs? Three. Now the oxygen has an octet, yeah? Two, four, six, eight. Oxygen has an octet. Carbon does not. Now, there's a structure with all valence electrons shown. Are you happy with that structure? Why not? Carbon does not have an octet. And that's one of the golden rules of good structure. Okay. Oxygen does. Now, is that typical bonding for oxygen? What do we say if it's not typical bonding? It's going to have a what? Charge. Yes. Is that typical bonding for carbon? No. Both of these have charges. Let's determine charges right here before we move to a better structure. What's the charge of the oxygen? Negative. Negative. Charge with a circle charge. How do you know it was negative? Okay, here's how you determine charge. You count the number of valence electrons that came from the oxygen in this arrangement. All long pairs come from the oxygen. And then, it's like over here if we did a, a dot and an X. Okay, one electron from oxygen, one electron from carbon. <coughs> so only that dot came from the oxygen. So one electron of each covalent bond comes from the atom. So how many electrons did oxygen bring to the dance? It brought two, four, six, and one of those is seven. Okay? I, I say ohms seven. So in this arrangement, it ohms seven. How many is it supposed to own in the neutral state? Six. Six. It's group six. Therefore, it has how many extra electrons? One. One extra electron. Therefore, what's the charge? You got an extra electron. Negative one. Okay. Now, how many electrons does carbon own here? One from that bond, one from that bond, one from that bond. No lone pair. So the carbon owns three. How many is it supposed to have? Four. It's group four. It's supposed to have four. So does it have an extra electron or what? No, it's missing. One electron. If you're missing an electron, what's your charge? Positive. Positive. Okay. Net neutral. How did I know it was going to be net neutral? Because the formula I gave you didn't have a charge. If you show a structure or a formula and it has a charge, you should show the charge. I mean, if you show acetate, what do you always need to show with it? Negative. If you leave that out, then you're trying to trick somebody. No charge given. It's because there's no charge here. It's net neutral. Okay. This is a potential Lewis structure. Is it the best one? No. How can we get a better one? Okay, this is what you do from here. This carbon needs electrons. What do you want to do? How about if we just put another long pair there? Well, then we'd have 14, and we don't have 14. So where are we going to extra electrons from? What if we take two away from there and put them here? Well, now that's good, but that's no good. What do we need to do? This oxygen is going to have to share more again 
And this is very important here. What do we want to do here? We want these electrons to basically move here and make a bond. I'm going to say these electrons move here. I'm not saying they, they jump over here as a long pair. They fall in here as a bond, and that is going to give what? A double bond, and now we have C. Now we have double bond, how many long pairs on oxygen? Only two, because the other, the third long pair moved in and made a second bond. We're going to call it pi bond. Right here is the first mechanism arrow. We will use arrows. You've got to learn how to use arrows or you will get lost moving forward into the net too. Every time I use an arrow, I will try to circle. If it's a long pair, I will circle the long pair that we're moving. And I will start by saying these electrons. These electrons move in and make a second bond. That's what that means. WDAM. What does arrow mean? Okay, when you get quizzes and tests back, if it says WDAM on it, that means I don't understand what your arrow means. So where's the arrow pointing to? Which arrow? This arrow? No, the one I love. What does this arrow mean? It means these electrons are moving in to make another bond. So it points to the carbon? Or the bond? Or the bond? Bonding area? The only way I can see it giving fusion, I'm not saying the two electrons are jumping over here and becoming a long pair over here. It's more like uh, they're sitting here and you're pulling them in to make a bond. The arrow is like it's pulling the electrons that way. Okay? As we do more and more, you'll see and see. So, if we, if we do this, we get that. How do you like this structure? Carbon is filled with octet. Carbon, oxygen has octet. What do we end up with, though? Double bond. This formula requires a double bond. What's the, what's the relationship between these two structures? Yes. These here are resonance structures. What's the definition of resonance structures? Did we change the connectivity in going from one to the other? Carbon connected to two edges and an O. Carbon connected to two edges and an O. We did not change the connectivity. Double bond does not make a uh, difference in connectivity. So we did not change the connectivity. So an unconstitutional isomer. It's actually not isomers at all. The resonance structure. And that requires some reading. We'll develop the idea of resonance over a couple of weeks. Resonance structures only differ in placement of electrons. Connectivity is the exact same. So before when we saw resonance structures, it would be whenever there was a O on multiple spots and basically it was showing that that double bond really wasn't a double, but it was like a two-thirds or one and one-third bond, right, if it was like heading this is different, right? That, is that the first one existing? Is that part of it? Whenever you see resonance, both structures are really fake. Resonance, consider color. Consider one red, one white. The true structure is actually pink. The true structure is somewhere in between. Look at this here. What do we know about electronegativity? Which one's more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? Oxygen. So we can show a dipole here, right? That oxygen is pulling. As it pulls, what type of charge develops on the carbon? Positive. And what type of charge develops on the oxygen as it pulls the electrons towards it? It gets more like this. But is it completely like that? No. We can draw a structure 
the tree structure is sort of a bond and a half, partial plus, partial minus. There's your tree structure. You have a dipole there. And pi bonds are very polarizable. That pi bond, we could just take these electrons and move them back, and you'd get there. Tree structure's in between. It's not red, not white, but pink. We have trouble showing pink structures because they have these partial bonds. Instead, when we do resonance, we'll show kind of multiple forms and forms and say the tree structure's in between. We'll develop more of that as we go along. Okay, formula. You can tell from this formula that it had to have a uh, double bond. Okay? That's what we call the DUS. So go back to C. If you have CO, What's the maximum amount of H's that, that a, a compound with one C and one O can have? It's actually four. And we did that structure earlier. It's the first one we did. So this is just a C and an O, but it only has two H's. So that means it's not fully saturated with H's. Fully saturated would be four H's for C and O. So this has an unsaturation. Does that have the, uh, if you were to write that CHOH, does that exist as well, or if I mentioned something like that, the triple bond between the C and the other? Mm, I think you'd have a hard time getting the structure, possibly, okay. but not that I know of. Um, so this is unsaturated. Let's uh, see if we want to introduce that right now if I have it on another page. When I say DUS, that's what I'm talking about, degrees of unsaturation. Um, let's keep going because I don't know if we're quite ready to look at it. Try the next structure. Where are we at? D? Let's do H A N. I'm gonna do this one. Okay. Uh C and bond together. Where do you want to put the H? How many advanced electrons are we dealing with? Ten. Five, six, and four is ten. Uh, we got four up there. That means we have six more to put. Three long pairs. Where do you want to put long pairs? Now there's ten. Is that a good structure? Carbon have an octet? No. But that is a low structure because it shows all valence electrons. And things are bonding together. Uh, that's not typical bonding. What's the charge of this nitrogen here? Two. Two. Nice. Two. Two minus. What's the charge of the carbon? Two plus. Two plus. Carbon needs electrons. What do we want to do? How about if these electrons move in and make another bond? What does that give? By the way, the double-headed arrow is a resonance arrow. Okay, use it over here, resonance arrow. What does this arrow mean? Whatever it means, let's now draw what we have. What does it mean, Michael? We now have a double bond there. How many long pairs left on nitrogen? 
two, all we want to do, we can't do any more than what we showed with the arrow. So moving forward, everything you do has to be shown with arrows. I can't do one arrow and then have all types of stuff done. These electrons move in, I show it. Now let's assess, is this a good structure? Does carbon have an octet? Not standard bonding, what's the charge? Positive, what's the charge here? Negative, Negative. gotta be able to determine charges. Okay, do you wanna do something else here? We, we can't put any more electrons. What if we take these electrons and move them in again? What does that give? Now we have H, C, now we have three bonds. How many long pairs on nitrogen? One. How do you like this structure? How do you like me now? Okay. Nitrogen. Three bonds, one lone pair. Carbon. Four bonds, no lone pairs. Standard bonding, no charges. There you go. That's, that's your best resonance structure. The others are resonance structures. We would call this major resonance structure. And it would be typically the structure you would show if you show HCN, hydrocyanic acid, hydro, hydrocyanide. But we do know that that nitrogen is pulling, and so it's taking on some minus charge in real life. Now, does it pull that much? I don't know if it pulls that much. Okay. Um, degrees of unsaturation. We can look at this formula here and we can tell that it had to have uh, two pi bonds. We haven't called it a pi bond yet, but that's a sigma bond of two pi. We can tell just by looking at that it has to have a triple bond. That's the power of degrees of unsaturation. And let's look at that on the uh, and out. We, um, when I was in third grade, we used to take breaks and teach you your finger exercise. I don't know what it did. Do you like this? Miss Henderson. I don't know what, what she was doing, but we do that. I don't know what. Anybody need a break? Okay. All right, let's get going. Uh, we'll decide if we're going to take a break, but uh, what we'll do. Let's try to make good progress today. Degrees of unsaturation. Lots of information in a formula. saturation from structure or from formula. I reckon let's first do structure. A degree of unsaturation is essentially when it's missing hydrogens from max. Okay. I erased it, but we did two formulas already. We did what CH4O and then we did CH2O. We did these so this is missing two H's from max. And this indeed is max. We'll learn how to determine max. We're missing two. Therefore, that's one DUS. Every time you're missing two H's, that's one DUS. Now from structure. One double bond is one DUS. Essentially because if you want to make this a double bond, I mean, if, I'll write this down, I'm just trying to show you, okay? There is a good structure, CH3, CH3. 
you want to put a double bond between the carbons, well, you got to get rid of something. So you get rid of an H over here, and you get rid of an H over there. Now you put a double bond in, and the carbon still only has four bonds each. So to put a double bond in, you got to remove two H's. And when you remove two H's, it's one DUS. So a double bond is one DUS. If we put a triple bond in, how many H's would we have to remove from max? We have to remove four. And so that's two DUS. So each time you remove two, that's one. All right? One ring is also a DUS. Because if, if my hands have four bonds, if I want to bond my hands together, I've got to get rid of a bond on each end, then I can bond them together and make a ring. Okay. For example, how many degrees of unsaturation in HCN? Well, the triple bond is 2 DUS, so the answer is 2 DUS. On the other hand, how many DUS are in this structure? Do you see any high bonds? High bonds, double bond. No high bonds, do you see any rings? No. See, this is zero. Zero DUS. For one carbon and one nitrogen, it has the maximum number of H's. It's saturated with H's, which is in this case five. Up here, C and N, just like this, except we only have one. So how many H's is it missing from max? Four. It doesn't have five, it only has one, so it's missing four. Every time you're missing two, it's a DUS. So how many DUS? Two. You see it from the number of H's it's missing. You also see it from the fact that it has a triple bond. Uh, the example with a ring, just here, the structure, three carbons, this would be propane. It's totally saturated. By the way, how do you judge saturated? Three carbons, what's saturated? You can look at it here, it's obviously six, eight. What is saturated? How do you judge saturated? There's a formula here. It's actually below. Let's look down below. Formula comes from 2n plus 2, where n is the number of carbons. So let's look back up here. How, how do we know that's saturated? Got three carbons, what's 2n plus 2? Hey, saturated. And there's the 8 around it, and we see that there's no double bonds, no rings. Don't look at anything else. Right here. What's, how many DUS does this formula have? Well, what's saturated for three carbons? Eight is saturated. How many is it missing? Two. So it's missing two. So how many DUS is that? One. Every time you're missing two, that's one DUS. That right there has to have either one pi bond or one ring. That's what DUS does. Could this have two rings? No, it cannot. So if you're doing a structure disk, this tells you it can, only, it can have one pi bond or one ring. An example of that would be cyclopropane, where it just has the three-membered ring. So does that typically only exist in one form or the other, or is it between a cyclo and a one with a pi bond? No, I could show you another compound for that. I could show you and that's also C386. Instead of a ring, I showed you a compound with a pi bond. I was saying, like, whenever it's formed naturally, does it stay in one or the other, or does it go back and forth between the two? Mm, you could have either. I mean, those are constitutional isomers. Two different compounds, they happen to have the same formula. You good, Taylor? Yes, sir. Okay, back up from structure. It got hole punched. 
How many DUS and ibuprofen? This is just a... Okay. Lime bonds. You've got to get used to and quickly using lime bonds. Okay. They got hole punched. But uh, each point is a carbon. Yeah, let's take a little bit of time and look at, look at line bond, okay, a little bit here. First off, when I draw my benzene ring, high bonds don't get exactly put in, because uh, I'm sort of doing it quickly. <coughs> um, you may or may not want to redraw this, but what we have here is a See, it's, it's hard to draw them exactly. Um, it's basically a six-membered ring with three pi bonds. I mean, that's the maximum number of pi bonds you can have in the ring. And then we have here, and then we have here. Okay, line bond, all these points are carbons. Heteroatoms, non-carbons, we show. So oxygen, and then we have OH. Here's your Lewis structure, but again, it's missing long pairs. We put long pairs, we got long pairs there. How many carbons here? Let's do formula here. What, how many carbons? Question. Should there be another branch on the left side of it? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a four-carbon branch, which comes from butyl. It's actually an isobutyl group. Isobutyl. Isobutyl, that's where the I do comes from. Yeah. Uh, how many carbons? One, two, three, four. That's a six member ring, so that's 10, 11, 12, 13. It's a carbon there. C13, H. Okay, for your H's, H's are not shown unless they're on a heavy item. Heteratom. Otherwise, you have to know how many H's are there. This N carbon here, how many H's on it? Three. I only see one bond to another carbon. The other three <coughs> bonds must be to H's. So there's actually, I'll draw them in and I'm going to erase them. There's actually three H's there. And there's, so there's four bonds around there. Okay? So three, how many there? Three. Six, how many on that one? One, seven, how many here? Two. Two, nine, how many there? Zero. None, how many here? One. One, that's what, 10, 11, 12, 13? None there, how many here? One. One, is that 14? How many there? Three. 17. 17, 18, did we get them right? Uh, what's left? O2? Okay. From structure, how many degrees of unsaturation does ibuprofen have? Pi bond, pi bond, pi bond, pi bond. There's four pi bonds. What else do you see? And a ring. See, a benzene, which is very classical aromatic ring, has four degrees of unsaturation. Three pi bonds in a ring. Four, five. 5 DUS. We did that from structure. What about from formula? Ah, the 2N plus 2 was mainly for hydrocarbons, just hydrogen and carbon. How do you count oxygen? How do you count nitrogen? Well, it's listed on the page. Oxygen is easiest. You actually just ignore it. Because oxygen can just slip in between and, and make, make no change. Just ignore it. Okay? 2n plus 2. What is 2n plus 2 with the 13? 28. How many H's is it missing? 10. So what's the DUS? Because however many it's missing, you divide it by 2. So you see, we get the same from formula. It's 5 DUS. You need to be able to do it from structure or formula. 
But what if this is nitrogen? Halogen actually adds an H. Nitrogen, you subtract an H. You've got to figure out how to do that. Okay? And things like that, I'm not going to sit up here and teach you how to do it. It's explained in the handout. You have a textbook to read. I'm told you need to do it. Okay? We may or may not do examples. But that's an example of something that's there. Boom. Take care of it. Knock it out. Uh, what else is on this page? Uh, you can take a look at structure of Prozac. You can actually tell how many... This is never covered. It's not in, in your textbook. But you can actually look at that and tell how many bonds there are kind of being. Okay. And I, there's a page that tells you that. It's sort of miscellaneous. If you, think, if you find it useful, then go for it. Okay. What it does show you is the power of a formula of a formula can tell you. Um, okay. The U.S. One more charge, we did that. Carbon five bonds, no. What about silicon? Can silicon make five bonds? Yeah. yeah. Things in a row three can make five bonds because they have d orbitals. Because they have d orbitals in the valence shell, they can make more than four bonds. So silicon. Actually, with silicon, it's very common. A lot of times, if you drive to Atlanta, you'll pass trucks, and on the side, they'll say silicon tetrafluoride in a tanker. So that's a neutral. It's like carbon, it makes four bonds. Uh, we can also, it can also have this. Now, there we have a charge. What's the charge of the silicon? How many electrons is it on? Five. How many is it close to on? Four. What's the charge? Yeah. See, this is possible for silicon. It's got ten electrons around it. It's okay. It's a row three. Sulfur. Okay. Really only carbon, the ones we did, typical binding. You know, there's some really only ones that are restricted to eight. But carbon is very important. Don't do 10 around carbon. The, uh, uh, resonance, we did a little resonance. Functional groups. I think we're ready to look at functional groups. on the uh, functional groups in DUS formula, like over here. The uh, tables I, I give in the handouts are not from uh, like the Klein book, but from other books. Okay. Uh, my philosophy is, is uh, you don't want me to give you something you already got. I'll give you something new, different look. Uh, more for your money that way, yeah? Very generic here. And these are just hydrocarbons. What's a hydrocarbon? You got your alkanes. Those are all, they're totally saturated. Okay? Alright? Alkanes are often called saturated hydrocarbons.
Now, I reckon a cycloalkane is an alkane that's not, it's actually unsaturated because of the ring. Um, <coughs> if you have a double bond, it's going to be called an alkene. So it's got the ene ending. And then talking about double bond between the carbons. If you got a triple bond, it's alkyne. Two carbon alkynes actually acetylene uses uh, gas for torches. Uh, aromatic compounds with benzene being the main. Uh, <coughs> benzene. Uh, sometimes called a phenyl ring. Uh, phenyl, sort of an alternative name. Benzene ring. Okay, down below we have alkyl halides. This has an alkane with a halide. Generic like this. X is typically for halogen, any of the four halogens. For example, you could have a CH3 bind to a BR. So you remove one of the H's and bind it to the halogen. So it's now called an alkyl halide. You can also have aryl halides. I put this one in. For example, an aromatic ring bind to a halogen, aryl halide. R is generic for carbon. There's no R on the periodic table. You see R, it can be one carbon, it can be 20 carbon. An R with an OH on it, CH3OH, it's an alcohol. And we showed, we did a little structure of methanol earlier. If you have an oxygen with carbon groups on both sides, plain carbon groups, like this, that's an ether. In Civil War, they used ether to knock people out. That was actually diethyl ether. And so you could have just a longer chain. And so this would be diethyl ether. That's, that's the compound used in the Civil War. Um, let's talk about how I drew this here. You see how I drew this CH3, and I did not put the, the H's out like this. Okay. This is obviously a little quicker, very common. Um, this is sort of called a condensed formula, where it's somewhere between structure, but it's not full structure. So you may see things like this. Obviously, when this is drawn like this, the three H's are not between the carbons. So you have to know really what the structure is, okay? Sometimes people will be a little bit more precise, and instead of drawing CH3, that way they'll draw it C, put the, put the H's on the outside. You, but you'll see it anyway. So it's a little condensed. Um, so realize that when you're looking at structure. Uh, amines, basically analogous to like ether, except we have nitrogen. But with nitrogen compounds, you can have, uh, nitrogen makes three bonds. If one bond is to a carbon, it's a primary amine. If two bonds are to carbon, it's a secondary amine. If, if all three bonds are to carbon, it's tertiary. Primary, secondary, tertiary basically tells you how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen. And ammonia itself is an amine, but there's no R group, so it's not primary at all. It's just kind of a carrot. Thiol is analogous to alcohol, except it's sulfur. Sulfur under oxygen is periodic table. Sometimes thiols are called mercaptans. Thiols are smelly. Uh, if you make a skunk mad, he'll squirt some thiol at you. Okay? Sulfide is analogous to ether. Sulfur with two R groups. Sulfides are sometimes called thioethers. Because they're 
analogous to regular heat. Please note that we're dealing with standard bonding, right? What's standard bonding for sulfur? Same as oxygen. What's standard bonding for sulfur? One bond, two bond, two bond. Two bond, two You see how it's got two bonds? Two bonds to carbon, two lone pairs. Okay. All these functional groups will have standard bonding. What is a functional group? It's just a common arrangement of atoms that you commonly see. And when we talk about compounds, we talk about it, we use functional group terminology just to describe the compound. Okay, on the back side, these are functional groups that contain the carbonyl group. Very important. Carbonyl is C double bond O. A carbonyl is not a exact functional group, it's a component of many functional groups. Aldehydes have a carbonyl. Carbon makes two additional bonds. If one is to H and another is to carbon, it's an aldehyde. A ketone is where both of the bonds to the carbonyl carbon are carbon. One of them is an H, it's an aldehyde. Ketone, like acetone, acetone, common uh, fingernail polish remover. Carbonyl with OH on one side, R on the other is a carboxylic acid. It's the most common of your organic acids. Acetic acid, that's acetic acid right here. 10% solution in water, no new salad. Yum yum. Don't put 100% acetic acid in your salad. Not yum yum. <laughs> uh, Esther. Analogous to this, except the O, instead of OH, it's OR, meaning it's O carbon. Something like that. Uh, amid, amid, amide. I say amid. Amids, carbonyl with nitrogen on one side, carbon on the other. Now with amids, if you put things on the nitrogen, it's still an amide. See up here, if you put something on the oxygen, it's no longer an acid, it's an ester. Here, you put groups on the nitrogen, it's just a primary, secondary, or tertiary amide. That's a primary amide that's shown. If we put a, uh, it has one bond to carbon, now we have two bonds to carbon, now we have three. Primary, second, tertiary, the number of carbons, number of bonds to carbon. Acid chloride, a little bit generic at the introductory stage, see a lot more organic. Two, R group on one side, chlorine on the other. You can have other halogens on the right, it's just in this type of compound, the chloride is probably the most common. There's some others I wanted to add to the list. Nitrile, uh, it has the cyano group. Carbon bonded to a carbon. We have something like this: carbon, 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 cyano. Nitrile. Then your sulfonamides. Note that it is a kind of amide, except it's a sulfon amide. That is, instead of a carbonyl between the R to N like that, the regular amide, it has the SO2. Sulfur has an expanded octet, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 electrons around it, because it has D orbitals. Substitute the nitrogen, primary, secondary, tertiary. Sulfonamides are seen a lot in drugs, that's why I want you to know this one. Uh, you got your sulfonamide antibacterials, your sulfa drugs. What other drugs have sul sulfonamides in them? By going to go to pharmacy school, medical school. Somebody say something? I'm going to say that in my eye, like sulfonamide. Uh huh. So, example of a sulfonamide drug. Okay. Any other class of compounds that have sulfonamides in them? Uh, 
some of your newer diabetic drugs have sulfonamides. Okay. And plenty of other examples. Uh, okay, here's labeling functional groups. Uh, Tinolol is an antihypertensive agent, high blood pressure. What do we got right here? Obviously, these are already labeled for you, but there's an antid. Aromatic green, ether, oxygen binding to two carbons. Alcohol, amine, what type of amine? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Secondary. Secondary amine, cause an oxygen bond to two carbons. Uh, then there's a uh, compound on the right. There's a couple others I want you to know. The listed down here. You might say this is an alcohol, but when the OH is on an aromatic ring, it's called a what? Phenol. Phenol. That works. I say phenol. Either way. So it's a phenol. The OH is on the aromatic ring. It's a special type of alcohol. Typically always called phenol. If the amine is on an aromatic ring, I added this one in, what's it called? Aniline. The amine is on an aromatic ring, especially benzene ring. Uh, okay, so in the workbook you'll see questions like, like this drug sheet page. Lots of drugs. Determine formula in DUS for each drug. <coughs> Name the functional groups in each drug. Uh, how many long pairs are in each drug? Determine the hybridization of each heteroatom. Well, next topic is hybridization. Okay? There's worksheets to be doing. Uh, provide complete Lewis structure for these compounds. Uh, charges. DUS. The other thing is with the textbook, whichever textbook you're using, you look in the index and find the topics you're covering until you read about and do questions in your textbook. For the uh, functional groups with the carbonyl, do they have to have a another carbon attached to the hydrogen uh, group, or can it just be a hydrogen in that group? Well, we did. I mean, we did like aldehyde. Right. H on one side, carbon group on the other. Well, this could also be an H. Basically, if that was instead of having another carbon attached to it, it was just another hydrogen. So it's the. So you want this? Yes. Is that considered that? That's actually kind of a parent. Uh, that actually has a name. Anybody know the name of this? And from the name, it's actually it, it's apparently an aldehyde. Uh, what's the name of this? Formaldehyde. Uh, any other variation, you have to start putting something here, and you got to keep it, keep this a carbon to be an aldehyde, so you can put, you know, you can build your molecule, you know, one bond, three long pairs, two bonds, two long pairs, okay. Um, so let's see where we're at. Functional groups. Three. We made the Roman numeral four. I was looking everywhere, saw her first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, let's look at hybridization. Uh, let's look at methane. Okay, SP3. Uh, before we probably drew this out sort of like this, and we didn't really consider bond angles or anything about the, the orbitals and the bond strengths and the inward there. Uh, this is actually an example of SP3. What does that mean? A lot of this you saw in Gen Chem. Uh, we'll take it a step further here. Ground state configuration. We did that right. Let's see, we have the 2S and the 2P. Uh, you got to remember, uh, I'm through, right? So there's ground state configuration for carbon. So if you started with this carbon and it had those, that orbital configuration, can you imagine making this molecule making four bonds? First off, something we know about this. This is four equivalent bonds. Four equivalent bonds. We know that from uh, analysis we can do on the, on the molecule. So how are we going to make four equivalent bonds with what we got here? You want to bring in and, and make them fill that right there with maybe an electron? Electron. Well, hold on. I mean, look right here. What is that right there? There's two electrons sitting right there together. Isn't that a long pair? Yeah? I mean, do we see a long pair here? So what's going on? What I'm trying to say is we cannot get four equivalent bonds and no long pairs with that configuration. Well, chemists realized this a long time ago and said, so we, we got to, okay, what's going on with the carbon covalently bonds? And the theory of hybridization came up. And a lot of this is it's all based on math. Okay? So the foundation is math. We'll do it simple. Remember the book that thick? Okay. Instead, these orbitals, uh, we're going to mix them together. And a fancy word, got a fancy word for mix. What do you want to, what do you want to call it? How about hybridize? Is that fancy enough? Okay. It just means mix. Um, what do we need over here? I see four equivalent bonds. What do we need? We need four equivalent what? We need four equivalent orbitals. Well, we got four of these atomic orbitals. The idea of hybridization is, well, if you need, if you need four new ones, you've got to mix four. So if we need four equivalent, the idea is we're going to put all these four in a blender. Okay, put them in the blender, turn it on, blend them up. Then we're going to scoop out four identical orbitals. And we're going to get um, so after we blend them up, mix them, we get four identical ones. But what do they look like? What do we call them? Well, they no longer look like an S or a P. We'll try to show it. What are we going to call them? It's very simple. We, we, we name them what went into into the blender. What went into the blender? 1s and 3p's. Everything went into the blender. So we're going to call them sp3's. So this is four sp3 orbitals. Each one is called an sp3 orbital. But it's like make, mixing a gallon of vanilla and three gallons of chocolate in the blender and you pull out Four gallons of chocolate Okay, because that's what it went in. That's what it went in. Now we can put in our four electrons, just like we do according to Hunter rule, polyops, uh, all that. Boom, boom, boom. And this kind of becomes our new ground state, except we don't call it the new ground state, we call it the hybridized state. 
But now we're set up to bring in an H and make a bond to carbon with an H and make a bond to carbon with an H and a bond to carbon. Now, we're, now we can bring in four H's. You know, this idea here, one electron, and we get four equivalent bonds. You gotta know what you started with, what we what we blended. So what do these guys look like? Well, they look like somewhere in between these two. Now, do they look more like S or more like P's? They look more like P's. Why? Because three P's went in. I mean, if I put three gallons of chocolate and one gallon of vanilla, is the mix going to taste more like chocolate or vanilla? Okay, question. So are they actually equal? Or does the S1 have more properties of the S and the P's one more properties of the P? Basically, why? Because that kind of makes me wonder why, why couldn't a carbon just use one of the three S orbitals when they get that expanded octet if it can just mix everything up? Um, I'm sorry, carbon is one? So if it's, are they all equal, I guess, was the first Over there? Like equally equal. Yes. Yeah, they're equally equal. Okay. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what you're asking about the alternative. So uh, what, do they, what do they look like? When we describe this, we, we say something like this. 25% S, 75% P. Does everybody agree that one of these orbitals, okay, it's going to look more like a P orbital. Um, let's do some others and then we'll maybe draw the shapes, okay? This is going to be important though as we move forward. The others will vary. Now we can make that. Uh, I kind of need to draw them now. Okay. But I'm not going to draw it at sp3. I'm going to draw it at sp. Later on we'll do sp and we'll mix s. Let's say the phase is positive. And then let's mix in a P orbital. And the P orbital I'm going to draw sideways. We're about out of time here. Now this has phase of like plus minus, opposite load to different phase. Okay? If we mix these two, it's all based on math. But over here, that's plus and this is plus. So this reinforces. So when we when we mix. This reinforces so it sort of gets here. On this side, the minus and the plus does not reinforce. It negates each other. But it's not completely because there's different shapes here. Over here, you get something that's kind of small. Because the faces, they were out of phase, deconstructed. And so this would be an SP. This is sort of the idea. It's, it's more difficult to draw the sp2 and the sp3. Uh, this is the back lobe. We typically will not draw back lobes. It's there. Test 3 will mention the back lobe again. The important thing is the more s character, the fatter it gets and the shorter it gets because the more it starts to look like an s orbit. We'll, we'll finish up here. We'll continue here next time. I do point out that on the back, my crude drawing, which I just added new, here. Okay. 50% S. The more S character, the more it becomes spherical. So which, which hybrid is longer? SP3. Less S character. More like a key or. Okay, guys. Uh, SI is at um